quédese con nosotros, no se vaya. También durante el transcurso de este servicio, las puertas de verdad de entrar del templo están abiertas. Si usted quiere pasar y dejar su diezmo, ¿verdad? Ahí, ahí están los sobres de diezmos, ahí está también el ofrendero, ahí nomás lo deposita para ayudarnos, ¿verdad? Para sufragar los gastos de nuestro ministerio. As we have the service, the front row of the church is open. You can come by and just drop off your tithes and offerings if you'd like to help us in this manner. Tithing envelopes are right there on the little table as you walk in. There are offering plates right there. Just leave it there. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much for believing in Christ and believing in this ministry. We pray that everything we do today will bless your, your life. As I woke up this morning, Ceci, my phone was ringing and ringing. I mean, all the text messages. He is risen, he is risen, he is risen, he's alive. And that's the reason why we rejoice. Estamos con ustedes esta hora porque al iniciar este día, mi tiempo estaba sonando y sonando. Y cada vez que había un mensaje decía, el ha resucitado. Tengamos gozo, regocijo en la victoria del creyente. Y pues estamos ahora congregados aquí en la casa del Señor. Nosotros tenemos la dicha de estar aquí en la casa del Señor. Usted está en su casa, el lugar que Dios le da a usted. Estamos unidos con mismo este idea, un mismo espíritu, aunque la distancia nos separa, ¿verdad? El espíritu está unido en la presencia del Señor. To be able to come to your house today to bless your life with the ministry of Jesus Christ. I pray that today will be a blessing to you. We're here at church. You're there at your home. Distance is not a factor for God. He's everywhere. He's here with us. He's there at your house also. And the one thing we want to do is come together as the body of Christ to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, I've seen it countless times in Facebook, different accounts saying, well, the building might be shut down, but we are the church. We, the church, come together. So the next hour or so, we come together to rejoice in the victory of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us. Bear with us as we go through both Spanish and English. We have a, two congregations in this church, one in Spanish, one in English. I'm combining both of them together as a church. We might partake of communion, so be patient with us. Be there. And if you don't understand Spanish, I've got to it to you, okay? And uh, if you don't, and you don't understand English, que yo se lo revele a ustedes también, lo que queremos es ser de bendición para cada uno de ustedes. Cuando pienso yo a tocante de la Pascua y pienso, ¿verdad?, lo que estamos celebrando, hago también memoria de tantas cosas que Dios ha hecho para nosotros. God has done countless things in our behalf. He's met our every need. He's healed our bodies. I mean, He's blessed us in so many special ways. Yet today we come to just remember what He did for us on, on Calvary. It's a time like this that we go to the ordinance. There's only two ordinances given to the church, water baptism and communion. Hay dos ordenanzas que os ha dado la iglesia, que es el bautismo en agua y es la Santa Cena. En ambos, ¿verdad?, son simbólicos. No es algo literal, es algo simbólico. El bautismo en agua es muerto al pecado, resucitado con Cristo. La Santa Cena también es simbólica. El pan representa el cuerpo de Cristo, el vino representa la sangre que vivió por nosotros. As we go to communion and the Lord is given unto us, we understand that also water baptism is part of the plan for the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all symbolic. It's not a literal situation, it's symbolic. That we might give a living testimony of the things that surround us, how we have been blessed. So when you're going to water baptism, when you're immersed into the water, it means dead to sin. When you come up, resurrected with Jesus Christ. Symbolism of relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Then when we take communion, the red represents the body of Christ, and the wine represents the bloody shed for us on Calvary. Now let us understand that today as we go into communion, let's understand what we're doing. It's a remembrance of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us. A sacrifice he made 2,000 years ago that we might understand he did this but one time uh, throughout his life. We call it the Last Supper. When we talk about communion, we talk about the Last Supper. How often has to be done? That, that's debatable. Uh, some churches do it the first Sunday of every month. Others do it uh, every Sunday. Different places we get practices in different ways because the Bible does not stipulate how many times it should be done. But we should do it as believers and the Lord Jesus Christ. El poder participar de la comunión es algo que Dios nos dejó a cada uno de nosotros. Cada quien practica ¿verdad? la comunión de diferentes maneras. Unas iglesias lo practican el primer domingo de cada mes. Religiosamente lo hacen el primer domingo de cada mes. Otros lo practican cada domingo. Y la importancia es esto que lo hagamos. Porque lo que estamos haciendo, estamos participando a hacer memoria del sacrificio que Cristo hizo por nosotros en la cruz del Calvario. Y por ese motivo, el, de, el hecho que estamos aquí en esta mañana para celebrar no su muerte, mas su resurrección. Sabemos que la muerte marcó el sacrificio para la resurrección, selló la victoria para cada creyente. Y por eso podemos tomar esta la última cena recordando lo que Cristo hizo a favor de nosotros. When he broke bread, the Bible says, with his disciples, for one last time. He said, this is my body that is offered unto you. 
See, he wasn't speaking that we take communion today. The bread is not the literal body of Jesus Christ. It's a symbolism of his body. The pain and affliction he took upon himself. For you see the day of ascension, I read in the Bible, in the book of Acts chapter number 1, when Jesus left and ascension heaven, he took his body with him. He was taken up into the clouds, into the presence of his Father. And today, too, when we take the bread, it's a remembrance, a physical remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for us. He says this is bread. Why? Because re bread re represents food. It, it represents uh, uh, food for our body as our physical body needs food to function, so does our spiritual body need the food to be able to understand that Jesus Christ is with us. For he said, Lo, I am with you every day of your life until the end of the world. Al tomar del Señor el pan. Y lo partió y dijo, Tomar, comeste mi cuerpo, que vosotros es partido. Entendemos literalmente que este no es el cuerpo de Cristo. Cuando Cristo ascendió al cielo, se va al cuerpo con él. Ve el capítulo 1 del libro de los Hechos, donde habla de la ascensión de Cristo, ¿verdad? De nuevo a la presencia del Padre. Por lo tanto, al tomar el pan representa, ¿verdad? Vida, representa alimento, representa lo que necesitamos para funcionar aquí en la tierra. Y también el hombre espiritual. Lo que Cristo hizo para nosotros, Él utiliza el pan que representa alimento, que uh, representa sustancia para nosotros. Entonces, utiliza eso para identificar lo que Él ha hecho por cada uno de nosotros. Porque Él dijo, yo vino para que tengan vida y la puedan tener en abundancia. Después, cuando tomó el vino, dijo, este es el nuevo pacto. Posteriormente, el pacto antiguo fue el arco iris que puso cuando el diluvio, que dijo, jamás, ¿verdad? El arco iris marca la promesa de Dios diciendo, visiblemente, jamás volveré a destruir a toda la humanidad por medio de, una, de un diluvio. Y cada vez que ve, usted asome y vea el arco iris que está ahí, todavía la firma de Dios diciendo, esto no va a destruir a toda la raza humana. Y por ese motivo, cuando él toma y dice, el nuevo pacto está hablando la sangre que él iba a vertir por nosotros en la cruz del Calvario. Recuerde, cuando él toma la Santa Cena, todavía no ha muerto. Simplemente está anticipando la antecedente de lo que va a venir, ¿verdad? Posteriormente, dentro de unas 4, 24 horas después de eso, esto iba a suceder. Por lo tanto, que dice? Y tomó la copa, es el nuevo pacto. Y dice, voy a firmar esto. La firma del pacto, usted sabe que cada pacto lleva su firma. Un cero diciendo, yo prometo esto. Esta es mi firma diciendo que yo garantizo esto. Cuando usted firma contratos, ¿verdad? Dice, estoy garantizando pagar diferentes cosas. Cuando el Señor hizo el nuevo pacto, Él lo firmó. ¿Y cómo lo firmó? Lo firmó con su sangre. Y por eso cuando hablamos de la sangre de Cristo, la sangre de Cristo nos limpia de todo pecado. Esa es la palabra del Señor. When he took the cup also, he talk, talked about the new covenant we have in the, with the Lord Jesus Christ. For we understand the old covenant was about the rainbow he made. Uh, to be able to proclaim that he would never destroy mankind again through a flood as in the time of Noah. So therefore, as we live even today, thousands of years later, every time you raise, you look up and there's a rainbow, beautiful rainbow, is God's signature, I'm still with you, I'm still in control, I haven't left you, I haven't broken my promise. I will continue to love you in this manner and you'll always know visibly that I'm still in control of all things. So when he takes the cup, he says, a new pact. I'm beginning something new in your life. Something different is going to happen in your life, and this is what I'm going to provide for you. That through my shedding my blood on Calvary, your sins might be cleansed, totally cleansed. That every unrighteousness within your life might be forgiven. That you might understand that when I shed my blood on Calvary, on that day, at the further cross, there's going to be a puddle of blood. But when I am risen from the dead, that puddle of blood will become a fountain of praise and honor and glory, of forgiveness and power and authority for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason why. When we take the cup and partake of the cup, we're saying thank you, Jesus, for that new pact. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity, Heavenly Father, to rejoice in our victory and to come to understand because you live, we can face tomorrow. For you see, we don't celebrate death, we celebrate victory in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And communion only seals the deal. It only makes us understand God's still in control. And we're saying thank you, Jesus. It's one way for you to say thank you, Jesus, for all you've done in my behalf. We're going through a trying time. It's difficult for me to say thank you, Jesus. But in the midst of all that is happening, understand one thing, God is still in control. If anyone can meet our need, it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a better time to take communion and to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we face this crisis on a worldwide basis, we understand 2,000 years ago, the answer was already here. The answer was placed for us by a man called Jesus, who died and gave his life. On the third day, rose with power and glory. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. El sello, la bendición de Dios para el día presente. 
El tomar la Santa Cena es decir gracias a Dios por todo lo que has hecho a favor de mí. Cantidad de bendiciones. Para muchos ahorita es un tiempo dificultoso, ¿verdad? Por todo lo que está sucediendo a nivel mundial. Pero entendemos una cosa, el precio que Cristo pagó dos mil años atrás es la respuesta a la circunstancia que tenemos. Denle gracias a Dios que usted y yo tenemos la respuesta. Tenemos una seguridad, una certeza. Está, hemos sido, ¿verdad?, bendecidos con el hecho que la palabra nos enseña que si Dios por nosotros, ¿quién contra nosotros? Nos enseña que la mano por Él está sobre nuestras vidas, en nuestros hogares, para ayudarnos en nuestras necesidades. ¿Y por qué no decir gracias? Dios ha sido bueno, grande, grande, lento de aire y grande misericordia. Y por eso nos acercamos a la mesa del Señor. Pregunta usted, ¿y quién puede entre en acercarse? Todo aquel que ha creído en su Jesucristo, ha recibido y es parte de la familia, tiene el derecho de acercarse ante la presencia del Señor y tomar la cena. Él no quiere que comas de las migajas, siéntete a la mesa del Señor en esta hora y recibe la plenitud del reconocimiento, la gratitud. Cuando tú agradeces a Dios por este medio, Dios va a bendecir tu vida. Toma un momentito simplemente, un momentito de reconsagración de tu vida ante Dios. Pide perdón por tus fallas. Pide perdón por aquellos de donde has cerrado la vida. Limpia tu vida para poder acercarte a la mesa del Señor. Siempre me recuerdo que cuando éramos chicos en la casa, para poder sentarnos a la mesa tenemos que pasar la inspección de la mamá. A ver, a ver las manos, ¿están lavadas? ¿Las uñas, todo está bien? ¿Por qué? Porque te sientas limpio a comer de la mesa. Era la regla de la casa. Cuando usted se acerca a la mesa del Señor, limpie su vida para que usted honre al Señor Jesucristo. Él le entregue a Él. Un corazón limpio, un corazón listo, un corazón bendecido, porque Dios está con usted. Tome un momentito, entréguese la mano del Señor. Pide el perdón, entonces dale gracias. Y después vamos a entrar a lo que va a ser la Santa Cena. Yo voy a leer en inglés, mi esposa va a leer en español. Usted tiene las instrucciones, yo digo cuando tome el pan. Y aunque estamos de distancia, muchas millas, pero estamos unidos en el Espíritu y en la celebración la resurrección de nuestro Señor Jesucristo. As we go into taking communion, I want you to understand this time of thanksgiving, to go in the presence of God and say, God, I thank you for all the blessings. And you might ask, well, who can, Pastor? Who can take, be a partaker of the Last Supper, the believers in Jesus Christ? As a believer in Jesus Christ, having received my Lord and Savior, it is your responsibility as part of the family of God to admonish, to understand, to celebrate the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way we do this is by taking some time for just a moment to spend with God. And the one thing we're going to ask of God is to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Let's cleanse our minds and our hearts of all undoing, all things that are not right within our lives. And place ourselves in a position that we have our rights to sit at the table of God to partake of communion. For you see, I'm mindful of the fact that when we were small, there were rules. I mean, back then you used to sit together as a family to eat. And there was always rules. Everything has to, has to be clean. We'd walk in and say, okay, let me check your hands, let me check your nails. It's clean, you can sit at the table. And today we bring to the table of God, and we sit at the table of God to partake of communion. I challenge you for just a moment. Take some time out. Just pray to God. And the first thing we do, we ask for forgiveness. The cleansing of our minds, of our hearts. The removal of our sin, that we might be right to sit at the table of God and to be able to partake. And when this has happened, then I will begin to read in English. My wife will then read in Spanish. I will give the instructions when to take the bread, when to take the wine. And once this is done, we're going to have a time of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this moment might be a blessed moment with you in your life. We have very few of us here because of admonition of being committed to what the law has said. There's only four of us here. And we have prepared the Last Supper for four of us are here in the house of God to partake as a family of God and be represent our church here. So we're going to ask at this time for Sister Christy Casarita, which is our PR person, and then uh, Sister Vero Garcia, who is our youth pastor, to come forth and receive the bread and the wine and get ready to participate with us. Va a pedir ahorita que venga la pastora asociada y en esa mano Christy Casarita que tomen el pan y el vino. A mi esposa que ella tome pan y vino. Y un servidor tomo el pan y el vino también nos preparamos para recibir y participar de la cena del Señor. Ore. Pray. Take a moment. Concentrate, believe, and trust. Remove all doubt. Embrace the presence of God. And let Him just be there. Just be there. Heavenly Father,
all the makers righteous as we enter into this celebration of life. It is through your blood that we've been cleansed. And now we get ready to partake of this great gift of life given unto us through you. Dios Santo, te damos gracias por haber escuchado nuestra oración, tocado nuestras vidas, perdonado nuestras fallas, y dado la oportunidad y el derecho de como es hijos tuyos acercarnos ante tu presencia, tomar del pan y el vino y ser bendecidos. Oh Señor, que la gracia tuya el poder de tu Santo Espíritu llene hogares donde están congregados familias a las ovejitas que has puesto en mi cuidado que están sintonizando en esta hora prepáralos a ellos también el corazón se prepara la mente se prepara y tú ya estás listo por lo tanto nos lanzamos nos lanzamos Señor a celebrar contigo la grande victoria que logramos y celebramos en este día because you are righteous, because you're God. I pray that your presence will be real in every household. I pray for all those who are members of my church also, especially for them, you put into my care. That through my leading, through my teaching, they might find the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, we bond together into your presence. And we ask, Lord, as we partake of communion, that the glory of God might be manifested. As your glory is here in your house, be it also at their houses. And we prepare, Lord, to celebrate. It's a time of celebration of joy. So Heavenly Father, take this moment in our lives and allow the Lord to celebrate with you. For I ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Paul speaking to Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, 23. He said, For I have received from the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And we had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is broken. For you do this in remembrance of me. Porque yo recibí del Señor lo mismo que hoy he enseñado, que el Señor Jesús la noche en que fue entregado tomó pan. Y después de dar gracias lo partió y dijo, Este es mi cuerpo que es para vosotros. Hacer esto en memoria de mí. Tomemos el pan. Take the bread. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you take this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. De la misma manera tomó también la copa después de haber cenado, diciendo, Esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hacer esto cuantas veces lo bebáis en memoria de mí. Porque todas las veces que coméis este pan y bebéis esta copa, la muerte del Señor proclamaréis hasta que Él venga. Tome la copa, you may take the cup. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that 2,000 years ago you thought of us. You saw us when we were still sinners and despair and so tremendous need. And when nobody else believed in us, you believed in us. So much that you gave your life that we might have life and have an abundance. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your presence, for your protection during this trying time. We thank you for your blessings. I thank you, Lord, for especially even family members of my family that have entered into the coronavirus and now are delivered, are being cast free of this situation. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for that miracle that you're working within my own household. I pray for every household that reaches out to you, the Heavenly Father, believing in who you are and trusting because we have a living testimony. We have the power of Jesus Christ. For we walk by faith and not by sight. And when we reach out, Lord, and receive your blessings, we can be thankful, Lord, for so many things. Let us focus on the good things. Let us focus on the power and authority that's to us. 
Let us focus on the companionship that we have and that we're never going to walk alone. I thank you, Jesus, that when nobody else cared, you cared enough to make me part of your family. And as your blood that has cleansed me for all unrighteousness, I believe in you. I trust you. I teach about you. I live for you. And I pray that all that receive, Lord, this communion will also bless you in such a special way. And be grateful to all the things you've done on our behalf. Even those that walk in the valley of some that haven't lost loved ones during this trying time, that they might embrace the promise of your fellowship, of the strength that surpasses all understanding, because you are the giver of life, you're also the one that brings comfort and strength to the broken heart. So today we pray, in spite of all the circumstances around us, we lift up our heads, we do not hang our heads in defeat, we are victorious through Jesus Christ. And because you live, we can face tomorrow. Dios Santo, te damos gracias por tus bendiciones. Damos gracias por la vida que nos has dado. Porque creíste en nosotros. Cuando el mundo nos dio y la familia aún nos dio como un caso perdido, tú extendiste tu mano y misericordia. Extendiste, Señor, tu cariño. Extendiste el perdón de nuestros muchos pecados. Nos pusiste, Señor, en el libro de la vida para participar de toda la bendición de tus promesas, Señor. El cumplimiento de tu palabra que estarías con nosotros todos nuestros días hasta el fin del mundo. Te damos gracias durante este tiempo caótico que estamos pasando, Señor. Donde algunos de nosotros, cual familia, hemos experimentado el toque de este virus ha llegado a nuestros hogares. Pero, Señor, por la gracia tuya, tú has tocado a mis hijos, tú nos has sacado ya de esta situación. Te doy gracias, Señor, porque tú eres grande, grande en misericordia. Te pido por aquellos Señor, que podamos gozarnos en ti, Señor, que atravesando vayas difíciles de la vida, Señor, sabemos que no estamos solos, que tú estás con nosotros. Gracias te damos, Señor, porque no te has olvidado de nosotros. Gracias te damos porque has enseñado tu mano y misericordia, Señor, y podemos celebrar un día más de vida, Señor, tu compañerismo, tu fidelidad, Señor, el poder, Señor, tomamos de tu mano, Señor, y poder saber. Señor que estás en control de todas las cosas gracias te damos por misericordia por tu paciencia Señor que has tenido con nosotros gracias por celebrar vida Señor y mucho mejor te damos gracias por ser llamados hijos del Dios Todopoderoso gracias por tu misericordia gracias te damos Señor porque a través de todo lo bueno que tenemos te tenemos a ti lo más grande, lo más bello, lo más maravilloso Gracias por tu compañerismo, gracias por tu bendición, Señor, y que este día no solamente sea el único día, que de este día en adelante podamos servirte con todo el corazón, con todo el alma y con todas las fuerzas, y ver tus promesas cumplidas en nuestras vidas, sabiendo, Señor, que tú estás en control de todas las cosas, y para siempre alabaremos y glorifiquemos tu santo y bendito nombre, Señor, recibe toda honra y toda gloria desde hoy y para siempre, gracias, Señor. Para todos aquellos que están sintonizando el programa ahorita, vamos a entrar al mensaje en inglés. Si quiere permanecer con nosotros por un ratito y escuchar el mensaje en inglés, es bienvenido. Si quiere esperarse un poquito, dentro de una media hora, este, si Dios así permite el tiempo, ¿verdad? Va a poder hacerlo, entonces va a aplicar el mensaje totalmente en español. Entre tanto, tenga paciencia, goce con los que se gozan, reciba palabra del Señor, reto de la palabra del Señor para su vida y como dije cuando inicié este programa que la puerta del frente de la iglesia está abierta si usted quiere pasar por la iglesia para dejar su diezmo, su ofrenda los ofrenderos están a la puerta también este, los sobres de diezmo para que se pueda ayudarnos a sufragar los gastos de nuestro ministerio, o sea, es que dentro de pronto estoy con ustedes, déjenme ministrar a la congregación en inglés, verdad palabra que Dios me ha dado para poder tocar la vida de todos aquellos que van a sintonizar este programa I am blessed by the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to proclaim his gospel and to meet the needs of people during this trying time. I'm really, really excited about this morning and being able to share this message for you. This message has been burning in my heart for quite a while. As a matter of fact, I preached a version of this sermon to my church about a month ago. And the truth is, I was kind of discouraged because a lot of people didn't show up to church. And I felt like, God, this is, I think this is the sermon that most of it has blessed my life as I prepared it. People didn't show up. I came to realize that this message was for me first. That I might experience the fullness of the word of God for my life. That in turn I could then deliver a challenge to my heart of those that were going to listen this morning. So as I began to prepare the message, to go into the message, we began to write my notes of the message I want to share with you. My heart I want to share with you as we celebrate the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ for all the believers. I started for a moment. I wrote everything I had to write. I closed my book, my notes. I prayed and I went to bed. I thought, okay, we're ready to go. And at three o'clock this morning, God woke me up. 
I had gone to sleep praying over the message. And I said that this may be a blessing on your life. I had left my television on with Christian music and a preacher. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, a message was being delivered that only just kind of sealed it. It kind of brought into focus the message and the challenge I want to share with you. I came to understand God's in control. God wants to speak to the church. God wants to use this Sunday in order that we might reconcile with him and find direction for our life and find the victory that God has for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because at that time, I was able to understand that I could hardly wait. From 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I just lay here and listen and listen and listen. At 4 o'clock, I got up and began to rewrite the portions of the scripture that I felt that needed to be addressed to the church, the body of Christ. At 4 o'clock, I stayed till 5. I went back to bed and I said, Lord, give me two hours of rest. I got two sermons to preach back to back and I want to be able to do justice to the things you have given me to share with my people. I slept a couple of hours and I could hardly wait. So when I received messages from people saying he is risen, I wrote to someone saying, I can hardly wait for this morning because I know that God has a message for the church. I know he has a message for his church. And when I thought about preaching a message, even before, even two weeks before we ever got to Easter, I felt in my heart, I said, I want to break away from a traditional message of the seven words and things that Jesus said from Calvary about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ on that morning and the emotion that was felt. Not because I don't believe it. I thoroughly believe it. I preach it, I teach it, but what was important to me was the following. Why is it only that one time a year we make emphasis on this? Why is it that only one time a year the whole world comes together and they celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I don't care what church you go to. Every church is rejoicing and the risen Savior, Jesus is alive, Jesus is with us. I mean, we all go through that. I said, but God, I want something that will lead us to celebrate Christ, not just one Sunday out of the month, that we might be able to keep him alive 24 hours a day, seven days out of the week, every day of our life, and never lose the passion, the desire that God to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him under the circumstance he has placed for us, that in Jesus Christ we are more than conquerors, that we might understand in serving him, there's a plan in his for our life that we can be strong and we can be delivered, we can go through trying times and not allow discouragement to set us down. So I found one thing. The only thing I found out that one element needed in order for us to be able to harvest and to keep this fire and passion in our hearts is that we need to grow. We need to mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. For you see, in our Christian walk, we need to mature. The day we receive the Lord, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He forgave our past, but we got today and tomorrow we're working about. We just got to work with those situations, and we can remain babies in the gospel. Pastors cannot just stand and bottle feed the church and bottle feed the church and make you feel good and don't want to hurt your feelings. We need to give you solid food. We need to do, understand that the Word of God, your life is going to be edified. And you cannot become a warrior as a child. You cannot become a warrior as a baby. You've got to become a warrior filled with the power of God and the Holy Spirit, the authority to move forward and come to understand that God has a purpose. God wants to deal with his family. God wants to deal with the church. And see, when I go to the Word of God, in 1 Corinthians, I want to paraphrase this to you. Paul said, chapter of love, he says, when I was a child, I would speak like a child, think like a child, you would react like a child. He said, but now that I'm a man, I've left those things that are childish. Church, it's time to grow up. It's time to realize that God is calling us to repentance, to reconcile with Him, and to restore the faith we had in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's asking all of us to take an inventory of our lives and to look what's happening within our lives. We're accountable not to man, not accountable to the pastor, you're accountable unto God. And today I challenge your life. That as you begin to mature and grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, leave those things that are children aside. You know, I talk about people saying, oh, well, I received Jesus Christ. I live all, I don't drink, I don't party, but then you picked up all these feeling sorry for yourself. All these things, oh, what they hurt me. Oh, what they think of me. Oh, what they did. Come on, grow up. There's a war at stake. Your eternity is at stake, and you're worried about if people love you, and you're worried about if people said something about you. I think we need to grow up. I need to really understand we're not just anybody. We are the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so do we need to embrace and run with it and let the world understand that the more I mature in my faith, then I can really receive and understand the will of God. 
Because the bigger the anxiety comes against my life, the bigger adversity comes within my life, my faith begins to grow. And the bigger the problem, the bigger my God. The bigger my God, the greater the victory. So people, come on. It's time to grow up and come to realize we're not in defeat. We haven't been destroyed. We have the power. We have the authority. We have the advantage of having the Lord Jesus Christ in our quarter to move forward and understand that God's in control of all things. When I look into the Bible, and see who could best teach me about maturity and growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I see Saul of Tarsus, where he began and who he became. I can learn from someone like that. I can understand from someone like that. And Lord, when he tells the people in, in the book of Philippians, he begins to write. Chapter number three of the book of Philippians, he begins to write about all the things that he was fulfilling as a Jew. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. He said, I am the Pharisee of Pharisee. Man, I'm a I'm a Pharisee at heart. I come from the tribe of Benjamin. I fulfilled all my commitments. I'm devoted to the cause. I mean, he talks about all these things. He was to religion. He said, but when I found the Lord Jesus Christ, I count this all as rubbish. This is nothing compared to what I have found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why would he say this? Because in the maturing process, he learned one thing. He needed to understand. He needed to walk different phases of his life to become the man that he became, become the servant of God. And it is he that in verse number 10 will instruct us. In verse number 10, we're going to find two things that Paul will give us. Two reasons why, things we have to practice in our life in order that we may mature. So I speak to you this morning on the second matter. What must I do in order to achieve maturity? The first thing he says in verse number 10, he says that I might know him. Wow. That really, really, really blew me away. So here's a man of God. A man anointed of God. But see, you need to understand. He said, I still don't understand the fullness of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to understand. You don't have it all yet. You have no idea how big your Christ really is. You have no idea his mercy is big. You have no idea how it works. So when I look upon the story of this man called Saul of Tarsus, you look at the book of Acts when Stephen, the deacon, is being stoned. And at that stoning, at the feet, the Bible said, at the feet of Saul of Tarsus, was placed the clothing of this man called, uh, called Stephen. It's at that point that he made up his mind, I'm going to destroy Christianity. For you see, he was a Pharisee. And when saw the cause of Jesus Christ, the cause of Jesus Christ was attacking his faith, attacking his religion. Attack him when he believed him. So see, when I look at the story of, of, of Saul of Tarsus, I stop and think for just a moment. You know, what he was doing was right on according to his faith, according to his religion. He was just defending it. He was going after it. Hey, this is attacking what I believe in. This is going against what we've taught the people. We can't let this happen. I will, as a Pharisee, I will defend this. So he makes up his mind to destroy Christianity. He made up his mind, I will be the man that's going to cause impact. For you see, during his lifetime, he never met the Lord Jesus Christ, but he knew of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you how he knew about the Lord Jesus Christ, because he had seen the manifestation of what was going on to the people around him. He had seen how he impacted the lives of so many individuals. Even though Christ was no longer here on earth, he had seen the manifestation of God's power. So when he saw, he said, I'm going to make sure that this happened, because he knew of Jesus, but he did not know Jesus. And the day the church is filled with people that know of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They sit Sunday after Sunday. They sing the songs. Some even raise their hands. We have no idea who he really is. You like it. You're moved. You feel good. But it's not about feeling good. It's about being changed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. For you see, as he went on the road to Damascus, he had an encounter that would change his life forever. The scripture said he was going on the road to Damascus. There came a light, a light, in, I mean, midday, a light that was more powerful than the sun. And the only one that has more power in light than the sun is the one that made the sun, and that's God Almighty. Man, when that hit, thing hit him, he goes down. And here's why I prove to you that he knew of Jesus. But well, once he went down, and he's trembling, and they're all watching, what's going on? He says, Lord, what would you have me to do? See, he didn't know. He was going to find out something. In the next three days of his life, he was going to go from knowing of Jesus to knowing Jesus, to finding him as Lord and Savior within his life. And Ananias is praying, God, that I may be used of you. God said, I want you to go pray. Give him directions how to get to Saul of Tarsus. He said, oh, is it Saul? Let's leave him now. He said, no, no. 
He is a chosen vessel in my hands. You have no idea who you are in God's hands. You have no idea the plan God has for your life. You're someone special. He didn't die just because. He died because there's something in your life. There's something you as a believer have to offer the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to use you for his honor and his glory. He wants you to understand. He didn't call you to come to church and warm a bench. He came to make you warriors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And once they prayed over him, and that deliverance came, and his blind was gone, and was filled with the Holy Spirit, then he begins to write. And even then, he says that I might. He experienced so many ways the fellowship with God. And he says, I still don't know all about him. I want to know all about him. I want to understand all about him. And today I want to challenge you, the church. There are some steps the church has to take in order to know who Jesus Christ really is. First to the church. In general to the church. Jesus Christ said in the book of Acts chapter number one, before his ascension into heaven, he said, before you even hold the service, before you even sing a song, before you even have a congregation, before you even proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, I want you to go into Jerusalem and I want you to wait there for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and you shall receive power when the Spirit of the Lord has come upon you and you will be my witnesses You'll carry forth the message of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He challenged the church under that, under that venue. Ten days later, as they waited upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, Amen. and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Why? Because God was fulfilling His word. He said to the church, you do nothing until you receive this. The history of the church has been... The beginning of the church, the founding of the church, was based on what? And the manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God. The life of the church is the power of God, the anointing of God within his household. That God would be with us to lead us to a higher ground. That we might understand that God's in control of all things. And yet, I'm sad to say that in many churches today, you can't worship God anymore. It's no longer good to say amen or glory or praise God. You're looked upon like a fanatic, like someone that don't know what's going on. And some churches are going to even usher you out of the church because you're disturbing the move of God's Holy Spirit. And God will abide and God will bless when there's praise, when there's honor, when there's glory, Amen. when there's a visible, audible manifestation of the congregation as God begins to deliver and begins to speak to the church. The church begins to react and then the Spirit of God begins to move people. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to move. He's not going to move with a bench. He's going to move with people like you and I, washed with His blood, cleansed by His Holy Spirit, and vested with the power and authority of the Holy Spirit given unto us. Why did He say the power of the Holy Spirit? He said to the Jewish nation at that time, you're going to need power. You know why? Because you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. Some are going to die for my cause. You need to have the power, the resistance to be able to go against this and give your life for the cause of Jesus Christ. And then you will need the power in order to deliver a message that will challenge the hearts and minds of people. It's called anointing people. The anointing of the Holy Spirit of God that comes over every believer, not only over pastors and evangelists, but about everyone that has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, about people that have embraced the promise of who Jesus Christ is. That's what it's all about, to move forward in power and authority, to come to understand the church needs to come back alive. The church amen. needs to understand we need the amen, we need the glory of God. We don't need to be phenom sitting out saying, oh no, I can't say that. Oh, I'm embarrassed to say this and that. Here we go to football games and, and we scream like fools. We yell at our heroes on the football field. Here we don't have the fortitude, we don't have the anointing, we don't have the desire, we don't have the passion to glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He, he, he should receive all honor and glory, all praise, because of who the church is. I heard one time, and it might not sit very well with some people, but you know what I heard one day? I heard the following way, he said, our churches are so cold today, you can ice skate down the aisle and shake hands with a polar bear behind the pulpit. You can be lost. We're playing church. We're praying church. We haven't seen the manifestation of God's spirit. Not because God's not God. And because we're not who God called us to be. And people would say, well, pastor, that's for old times. Things have changed. Well, the Bible teaches me that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. It teaches me that his word is never going to change. His word is always going to be in place. He's an ironic how in the book of Corinthians, Paul speaks about this. He gives the order in which the Holy Spirit is going to work. He speaks about the, 
nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then he speaks about the tongues and interpretation, gives an order to them that we might have these things in the church in an orderly fashion. There's an order to all this. I understand. Sometimes it can get very emotional for people and they get kind of get out of hand, but people don't allow this to stop what God wants to do for the church. We, the church, need to come back to Calvary. We need to come back to Pentecost. We need to find the fire of the Holy Spirit within our life. We need to allow God to work in a dynamic way. How can we expect people to be saved if we ourselves are not practicing the power and authority best in us as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because He wants you to be what He called you to be. Not just anybody, a warrior for the honor and glory of Jesus, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And to us, the believers, no. You're the believer, you're not the believers. We need to take the first step into what Jesus said. He delivered a challenge to us. He said, if anyone, anyone, that's you, that's me, anyone, is, if anyone wants to follow me, take the first step, deny yourself. Man. Forget about everything else. Because if you can't deny yourself, you're not a participant of what God wanted. First thing he wants you to do, he wants you to forget your past. He wants a total commitment of your life. Not the things that are convenient. Too many believers today are still living the old way of life. They've asked Jesus Christ to come into their heart and receive the Lord and Savior, but they don't want to practice the things of the world. They still want to be in the world. They still want to partake of those things that hinder God, God's relationship and God's power over your life. But he asked you for total command. He said, deny yourself. Just give up with everything. The Bible said you're a new creature in Jesus Christ. The old things have passed away. The things you used to do, the things you used to practice to fill the void within your life. You're seeking for joy, for happiness, for fulfillment. And when Jesus comes to your life, he fills every facet of your life. He's come that you might have an abundant life. You don't need the things you were once in your life. He said, walk away from me or be delivered from the situation. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Anything less than this, he's not acceptable. He does not accept anything less than that because either we believe in him or we don't. Oh, believer, examine your life. How much of the old man is still there? How much of the things you used to practice are you still practicing in the name of religion? In the name of calling it whatever you want to justify this sin within your life. And yet because sin separates you from God, you must embrace the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ and come to Trump and say, no, but God, you've asked me as a believer in Jesus Christ to embrace who you are, to walk under the power of the Lord invested in me. That if you were able to give your all on Calvary, I'm willing to give my all that I might have an abundant life in the Lord Jesus Christ. I promise you one thing. If you're committed to God, you give him your all, he will meet the desires of your heart. He will bless you in a very special way. He allows you to be the person God wants you to be. And into ministry. We get into ministry and the steps of maturity is the following. Because you have a beautiful voice. That's not good enough. Amen. God's not listening to your beauty. He's looking at your commitment and your devotion to him. For see, when you come to the altar and you take a microphone, you stand at the congregation in front of the altar to minister to the people that have come to receive of God, you're not that singer. You're the vessel of God at that moment. And if you don't know him, how can you reveal the power of God? If you haven't experienced him, how can you stand there and sing beautiful words that mean nothing, nothing from you? From the lips out, you sing beautiful things unto God. But yet the Lord says, with your lips you praise me, but your heart is so far away from me. We need singers. They're not so vested in beauty of voices, which is good to have also. But I'm like, it's not how beautiful you sing. It's how anointed you sing of the Holy Spirit of God. You begin to sing with a power and authority vested in you. You begin to feel the song. You begin to live the song. All of a sudden, at that moment, you become God's vessel to touch the hearts and minds of people. You're preparing the road for your pastor to come up and deliver a challenge into the church. No, no, you're not just a singer. You didn't just show up Sunday morning running in the church, grabbing the mic, and I'll go get his do this or do that the other. No, no. We're a church committed to honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and we either give him our best or give him nothing. We were not called to entertain. We were called to bless the people. We were called to minister. We were called to deliver a child. For you see, you understand something. Singer, as I speak to you, all you that say, let me speak to you in this word. The song will touch the lives of people. Some people will be touched before I even get up to preach my message. They'll be touched because through you, you sang the glory and the power in the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We prepare the hearts and minds of people. Some people receive the fullness of what they needed that morning because you were committed. It wasn't about you. At that moment, 
When you walked up to the altar, you left you down here and you brought the vessel before the altar of God and said, God, I'm here to be used of you. That I might enhance the kingdom. That I might be your representative. That I might be blessing to the church. That I might be that vessel you're going to use this morning. And that every word that flows from my mouth be covered with the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. For when I do these things, tears are going to be shed. Heads are going to be raised. Applause are going to go not to me, but to glorify the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We, the church, you, the singers, and know how to sing. Use your talent. Use your ability to glorify God. We're not out to make our own kingdom. We're out to establish Him. Do not, do not believe you can take your talent into the world and then bring it to the church. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Either you're God or you're not. God gave you a talent. You better use it for whatever He called you to do. You might not be as famous, but you will be blessed because you're obedient to God. You're taking that which God has given you and you use it to glorify His name to touch the hearts and minds of people. You, as a believer, cannot contribute to sin. You cannot be contributing to those that are being lost without Jesus Christ. And they want to come and sing in the altar of God about the love and forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're speaking on two sides of your mouth. God does not honor that. God does not, he's not glorified in that. Because he has other people with less voices, with less talent, but a lot of heart. And those he will use for an honor and glory. Who are you? Where do you stand? As you stand on Sunday mornings to deliver a song. Well, Pastor, I'm not the soloist, but you're a singer. I'm not the featured singer. It's not about being featured. It's about being loyal to God. It's about being part of a team that will glorify the precious name of Jesus Christ. To come together and understand that through your mouth and through yourself, you might be blessed. Now, last night, I was listening to a couple of songs. Being that our singers aren't here, I was going to kind of venture out and say, so which song are you going to sing? I said, well, let me think about it. And when I thought about it, I said, well, no, they need me to sing when we dismiss services. I said, but there's a song that one day I'll have the courage to do. And I, that's the last song I played before I went to bed last night. It says, flow through me, Holy Spirit, flow through me. That I might touch my fellow man, just flow through me. Let my hands be your hands as I reach out to others. Love through me, Holy Spirit. Just love through me. That I might be that vessel in your hands to impact the life of someone that is hurting today. And like the river of the desert, I might quench the thirst of those that are hurting. That's what we're all about. To serve and not to be served. To the musicians. God has given you a certain talent. And just like the world flaunts it to bring emotion to the people, you use your, your, your talent to glorify God. There's different rhythms we use in our songs. And I can tell, especially when you're in a Spanish congregation and they hit all these uh, songs that have all this Latin beat to it. Well, I tell you, it up for everybody, you know, they hit the guitar hits, the drum hits, the piano hits, they all start going, all of a sudden they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And for their old Israel, songs of that nature really pump us up, pump us up, pump us up. See people, let's not make people emotional. Let's get people convicted to the Lord Jesus Christ. That everything that flows from your guitar, from your drums, from your piano, glorify the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was based upon the promise of the premises that that music is going to be used to enhance the service and to touch the lives of people who are going to listen. Whether they're sitting in their congregation or watch over Facebook or watch over YouTube, that their lives might be blessed. We were called to serve people. We were called to give our best. We were called, we were given a talent that we might share the fullness of Jesus Christ. And those that are leaning toward music, that through music they might be brought to the foot of the cross. God will use any element, any situation to be used of God. But once you take the altar, once you take your position to do your thing for the of glory of Jesus Christ, it's no longer you. It's a Christ that lives within you. The ability to be able to portray the greatest music of all. To be able to lift people to a higher ground in their worship and praise. To come to understand that God's in control of all things, in control of your life. And you in turn are going to bless the minds of so many people. You know how many people are really blessed by music? That's why you have all these radio stations playing music. And you, the musician, have the power in your hands and the ability to touch the lives and hearts of people through the talent God has given unto you. Use it for the honor and glory of God. Let him flow through you. Let him flow through you. That every rhythm, every note that you play, 
would enhance the kingdom of God, and you would know beyond a shadow of doubt that God indeed is in control of all things. These things will lead us to mature in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to finish this portion of the message by saying the following. In the book of Acts, we're going to find that in the book of Acts, chapter number 4, verses number 13, once Peter and John have delivered the man at the, at the door of the, of the beautiful, it's called their mouth. So once the miracle is done, then they bring him in before the council to chastise him for preaching about Jesus Christ. And they're standing there before they're being chastised left and right. The thing I like about verse number 13, it says this. And when they saw them, Peter and John, they knew that they were not men of education. They didn't have a lot of education, but say, I love this, how it finishes. But they could see that they had been with Jesus. Oh, my brother, that they might see in you that you've been with Jesus. That people might see in you the fullness of Jesus Christ. They don't need to see it only in the pastor. They need to see it in every believer of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are his light. You are his representative you brought into the world. That they might see the joy of Jesus. That they might see the fullness of Jesus Christ flowing through you. That you, like Peter and John, hey, they didn't have a formal education. They were like very smart according to man. But they were men of God, anointed by the Holy Spirit. And the life reflected the power and the anointing of Almighty God. You know how much power and anointing? The Bible says they were lying the sick along the street. And even as, as Peter walked, even if only his shadow would touch and they were going to be healed. Because they had been with Jesus. How Amen. long has it been since you've been with Jesus? How long has it been since you spent time with Jesus? And people identify to you and shake your hand and say you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Not because your car has a bumper sticker, but because you're walking down the street with the Bible because they see the joy of the Lord within your life and your heart. I know it's trying times. The world is looking for answers. We are the answers because we have the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not time to be discouraged. It's time to give up. It's not time to quit. But understand this. Once you mature in your faith, you will be strong from within. Be able to face adversity and know God indeed is in, in control of all things. Let me quickly go to this last thing. The second thing in maturing is that I might know the power of his resurrection. You know, I did something, I've done something that Jesus never did in ministry. Really, Pastor? What is it? I've done it hundreds of times, literally hundreds of times. What's that, Pastor? Jesus never preached the funeral service because he was about life. I've done tons of them. Many, many of them. Preached many, many funeral services, but he didn't. Every time he faced death, he would raise him from the dead. He would bring him from the dead. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. I love the word might. It's conditional. He wants you to have life, but you make the choice. His desire is that you be full of life and joy and prosperity and blessings that you might have joy, that you might have life and have an abundance is determined by your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus dies on the cross and he delivers his body and he says it is finished and then Father into your hands I commend my spirit and the darkness that filled that place and the lightning and thunder and all the supernatural things that happened according to mankind, according to what we understand as a physical man it had come to an end. But it was only the beginning of the rest of our lives. For you see, they took the body of Christ and they placed him in the tomb. And in a secret place, there in the tomb, nobody was there, only Jesus. See, during the scripture and the Bible, he would raise them from the dead. But who raised Jesus from the dead? That I might know the power of his resurrection. I understand the power in this man called Jesus. That I understand the power of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And while the world mourned, the believers mourned, and the world celebrated his death, there in the tomb, a body that was lifeless began to breathe, began to tremble, began to be raised up. For in a secret place, he rose from the dead. And my brother, I want you to understand you need to go to a secret place with the Lord Jesus Christ. You need a resurrection of his power within your life. 
You need to find yourself separate from everything that is around you. You need to shut your ears off to what people are saying and begin to focus on what God has for your life that you might know the power of his resurrection. People, is not just any power. It's the power vested in you by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He didn't come that you might be defeated, that you might be destroyed. He might come that you would have an abundant life. But not only Easter Sunday, but every day of your life, you might experience the power and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I take the time to close our chain, as he said, and when you pray, close the door to your chamber and pray to your father that is in secret, and he that is in secret will reward you publicly. He will see you be blessed, and the world will know you're not just anybody, you're a child of the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Why did he say in the Proverbs of the resurrection? It's this kind of power that you're going to need in your life in order to beat temptation. For you see, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But temptation is all around you. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It is the greatest pleasure to see you fall by the wayside. He is committed to destroying the joy of the Lord within life. He is committed to taking away from you the promise of eternal life. He will use everything and anything against you that he can. He will bring your past back into play. Even though it's been forgiven, which you allow it to happen. You're allowed to come back into focus. You're allowed to bring discouragement. You've been allowed to look at things in your life. Many of you have stopped during this time, and instead of coming to your place, looking back at all the things you don't have. Things you have wanted and you don't have yet. Things you've asked to God and God didn't answer, it gets not time yet. That's why he hasn't answered. You haven't met the conditions they made within his promise. And you and I believers need to understand that the power of the resurrection is based on the fact that you take this power God has given unto you. The day he cleansed you with his blood, the day he filled with his spirit, and his power and his authority. He gave you the authority to stand before the demons of hell. To stand against temptation. To stand against all things that are righteousness. To stand under the power of the blood of Jesus. And claim victory. There's power in the name of Jesus. The resurrected Jesus. Not the crucified Jesus. I promise you one thing. I was there in Israel a year and a half ago. About a year and a half ago. I promise you I was there. I was there. And the tomb is still empty. God's in control of all things. I think if there's one thing I take from that experience, it's kind of a little funny thing that happened that day. There was 18 of us that made the trip, and only six would fit at a time. So we divided into three groups of going in to spend some time. And of course, there's other guys behind us, more people only come in. I was in the last group, and I walked in the last group, and we began to sing, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. The presence of God started to fill that way. All of a sudden, the guy from the next group says, hey, it's not time to have church, it's time to get out of there. You need to get out of there. No, it's just to see, not to have church. We finished our song anyway. And then we walked out, it was the last one out. And then that guy just looks into the tomb. He turns to other people, hey, it's finally empty. I turned and said, bro, it's been empty for 2,000 years. Because really, I've been there three times, and every time, why? Because God's in control. He wants to give you that you might know the power of his resurrection. His resurrection does not speak of pain of affliction. It does speak of devastation. It promises life and life in abundance. My brother and my sister, we need to grow up. We need to mature in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to understand that he hasn't gone us this far to walk away from us. He hasn't delivered us for us to fall back. He's here that we might have the blessing. That instead of celebrating only Easter Sunday, we can take this as a beginning point of our lives and say, God, I will serve you. I will honor you. I will glorify you every day of my life. And because you live, I can face tomorrow. No longer I live, but Christ lives within me. The promise of hope. The expectation, the fulfillment of God's promise because of his resurrection. Every promise is now in place. And I love, as I close this message, and this challenge to you, what Jesus said prior to his ascension. He spoke and he said, and now, after the resurrection, and now, when? Now. Not before. Not during three and a half years of ministry. And now, when? After resurrection. And now, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. My brother, all power is his. All honor, all glory, glorify his name. Praise Praise him because he's good. Ask him to let you mature in your faith. And as you 
go through this, if you're going through a trying time, I give you the resurrected Jesus. I love it. I love it when I look at the cross and see that the cross is empty. I look at the tomb and the tomb is empty. And I look at my heart and my heart is filled with the one who died from your own Calvary. And today he wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your Savior. He wants to be your help. But he's asking you to come back. Come back. Let's bring the church back to life. I really believe that when this is sought and done, God is going to raise a mighty army. God is going to raise an army of warriors. God is going to clean his house. He's going to allow this house to become house of worship. And he will be glorified. And we will see his glory. And we will see his power. And we'll see miracles and healing. We are the end time revival. We are the vessels God is going to use to bring that end time revival. For he said, in the latter day I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We are that flesh. We are the ones that have been asked to fulfill this promise from God. Are you willing? Are you ready? My friend, my brother, it's time to celebrate Jesus every day of your life. Amen. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. For Jesus Christ is alive today. He'll be alive tomorrow and day after and every day until the end of the world. And because he lives, let's celebrate. And let's make sure that we're part of the family. Make sure that they would make a commitment to God. And I pray that what I shared with you this morning, I shared my heart. I poured out my heart that it would have touched your life. Hit you where it hurt. But this message is not for the weak. This message is for the righteous. Amen. This message is not for quitters. This message is for believers. This message is to challenge the church to reunite, to refocus, to draw strength and get ready because victory is coming. Victory is on its way. And then we shall rejoice in the house of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful. I've been able to pour out my heart. Been waiting for this for hours since last night. For I knew you had a challenge to your people. I knew there was something you had to relate to your people. And I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be that vessel to challenge the minds and hearts of people. This is a message of encouragement, not of discouragement. It's not to call people down, it's to get people straight. It's about doing what you call us to do and to prepare for an end time revival. It's gonna erupt all over this world as the world reaches out to find you and make you Lord over the life. It's one last call to repentance. It's one last call to serve you as you deserve to be served, not as we choose to serve you. I thank you, God, for this morning. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for allowing me to be that vessel to develop that, to be able to deliver this challenge. I pray, Lord, that something said today would just light a fire in the hearts yes, of those believers. And we change from being churchgoers to becoming believers in Jesus Christ and see the fullness of Jesus manifested because that's what it's all about. When it's all about you, and we serve you like we should, then the power of God shall be manifested through our lives. We need to be your vessels. Cleanse us, use us, bless us, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. I call you God. Thank you, Jesus. I want to thank you so much for giving me of your time this morning to receive from the word of God. A few moments we're gonna just put some music on in the meantime. So I may change from Spanish then or from English to Spanish and deliver the challenge to the Spanish Spanish congregation. I pray this message is for you because it was for me one month ago. It came so much more alive last night and early this morning. That's what I was to share with you. The first one was for me. This one was for you. That God would really speak your life. And you walk out of this service today saying, Wow. Today we had some time with God. And today we didn't go to church, but we had church here in the presence of God. Thank you so much for listening. God be with you on Wednesday night. We have our Bible study once again at 7 o'clock. We'll be on with our Bible study at 7. And then next Sunday, if law permits, we'll be back here at the church. If not, then I'll do it from my house. Whatever it takes, we're going to get it done. 
the gospel will prevail. The gospel will go on. God bless you. I love you. God be with you and bless you. This week is a week of rejoicing. Every day this week, I found all that we might rejoice in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. God be with you is my desire. Dios nos lo bendiga. Ahora vamos al idioma angelical, el idioma del cielo, que es el español, ¿verdad? Y este, ya terminé con el culto de inglés. Y espero que tengamos tremendos resultados del mensaje que Dios ha puesto en mi corazón para poder compartir con ustedes. Tengo el mismo mensaje porque es la misma iglesia, mismo pastor, diferentes congregaciones en ciertos sentidos, pero todos somos hijos de Dios. ¿Listos para recibir reto de parte del Señor? Recibir su palabra y entender que su palabra nos hace libre. Este mensaje que quiero compartir con ustedes es un mensaje que he traído en mi corazón por más de un mes. Y la prueba es que prediqué un, algo semejante a esto. Lo prediqué aquí en mi iglesia a la congregación. Faltó mucha gente ese día al servicio. Y claro que somos humanos, sentí como que me desanimé diciendo, va. Para mí era el mejor mensaje que tenía para ofrecer y la gente me vino. Y claro que Dios me hace saber, yo traigo los que tienen que oír a su palabra. No entendiendo yo 
que realmente esa primera vez quería que el mensaje era para mí primero. Para yo podía disfrutar, recibir de parte de él, poder crecer en mi propia fe. A mí me da determinación servir al Señor, alimentar mi corazón y darme propósito para predicar cada vez que me paro tras este púlpito para compartir la palabra del Señor. Por lo tanto, anoche, cuando estaba escribiendo las notas que inicié durante la semana, yo quería traer un mensaje a la iglesia diferente en este sentido. Sé que las iglesias, los pastores han predicado las siete palabras, se ha predicado resurrección, muerte y resurrección de Cristo en esta mañana. Yo no tengo ningún problema con eso, yo también lo creo, yo lo predico, lo enseño, trato de vivirlo también para que podamos entender que en verdad Dios está en control de todas las cosas. Pero lo más importante para mí era lo siguiente, que al considerar las cosas que están pasando a mi alrededor, yo tenía que entregar un mensaje tan lleno de poder, tan lleno de autoridad que iba a transformar a nuestra gente. Yo quería cambiar la tradición de muchos individuos, de muchos llamados cristianos, de celebrar la muerte y resurrección de Cristo solamente un fin de semana por año. Quería que el impacto de la muerte y resurrección que la palabra enseña, que nosotros vivimos por fe en ella, podía venir a ser una parte integrante de nuestras vidas, de nuestra caminar, no una vez al año, sino que todos los días de nuestras vidas. ¿Qué puedo hacer, Señor? Dame un mensaje que pueda retar al corazón de tu pueblo, Señor. Que es importante no solamente celebrar la Pascua, no solamente este fin de semana, en este año, para reconocer la victoria que tú, Señor, lograste con nosotros en la cruz del Calvario, pero que esta victoria tenga efectividad, tenga verdad el impulso en nuestras vidas, que esté latiendo en nuestros corazones con el mismo favor que está haciendo en esta mañana. A través de todo el mundo, no importa qué iglesia usted asista, qué religión usted haya practicado, todo el mundo está celebrando la resurrección del Señor Jesucristo, el deseo de este siervo del Señor es que esta experiencia de celebración pase más allá de este domingo, sea una parte integrante de nuestras vidas en la cual podamos celebrar la resurrección de Cristo todos los días y poder saber que la abundancia de vida viene cuando yo reconozco un Cristo resucitado, un Cristo que escucha, un Cristo que puede llenar todas mis necesidades. Por lo tanto, pensaba yo, Señor, ¿qué es el método? ¿Qué es la cosa esencial? que es la cosa integrante que nos lleva a poder cultivar, despertar el interés en la iglesia, de pasar de una experiencia por año a una experiencia de todos los días, poder confirmar con el mismo vigor, con las mismas ganas, con el mismo entusiasmo, la vida, la muerte, la resurrección del Señor Jesucristo. Y me di cuenta que el elemento necesario para que esto pueda suceder en nuestras vidas es madurez y crecimiento. Pues a ver, el creyente, usted llega al Señor Jesucristo como único y suficiente Salvador. Y el momento que usted encuentra a Cristo, de ese momento hacia atrás, todo es perdonado. Y se inicia el camino hacia la vida eterna con el Señor Jesucristo. Pero no es el fin. Todavía hay que vivir todos los días. Por eso es para el Señor que aquel que comenzó en nosotros la, la sigue perfeccionando hasta el día de, de Jesucristo. Usted y yo, cualquier día, tenemos que realizar. Hay un proceso de madurez, de crecimiento que se tiene que desarrollar en la vida del creyente. Pensando en esto, pensé en 1 Corintios, capítulo 13, simplemente haciendo mención de lo que Pablo dice en este pasaje. Dice: Cuando yo era niño, pensaba con niño, estaba con niño, o sea, todo tenía que ver de niño. Digo, pero ahora que soy hombre, dejé las cosas que son de niño. Creo que el mensaje claro que está dando Pablo a la iglesia es lo siguiente. Es tiempo que la iglesia deje sus niñeras, que ya no anden como niños, que anden, verdad, siempre tristeando, siempre necesitando, verdad, una teterita de leche, porque si damos un mensaje, verdad, de carne, se ahoga, no saben qué hacer con ella. El crecimiento y la madurez, para con nosotros la certeza y seguridad, aumenta nuestra fe hacia un Jesucristo, para que cuando vienen los tiempos contrarios, porque van a venir, van a llegar los tiempos contrarios, cuando llega en ese momento, la madurez nos ayuda a aceptarlos a vivir con ellos, a vencerlos, porque entre más grande es el problema, más grande es nuestro Dios. Y entre más grande es nuestro Dios, más grande es nuestra victoria. Mi hermano, vos es el, en poder saber en esta mañana que madurez tenga un nivel totalmente diferente. Escucha a la gente testificar de su vida por creyentes. Doy gracias a Dios porque ella no toma, ya no fumo, está en todos los vicios de la vida, 
pero nunca mencionan que dejaron un lado los vicios, pero levantaron los sentimientos, que fácilmente se ofenden, se lastiman. Y el enemigo está utilizando esta arma contra la iglesia de sentimientos, de emoción, de mal sentir. Está robándonos la madurez con niñerías de la vida. Cuando estamos permitiendo que lo que la gente piense en mí, lo que la gente en mí, es más importante lo que Dios y yo conocemos de mi propia persona. Dios está retando a la iglesia a que maduremos, que entendamos que este mensaje es para guerreros, no es para niños, es para guerreros. Hay una lucha frente a nosotros, una batalla que se tiene que pelear y no lo puede hacer con niños, necesita hombres y mujeres lavados con su sangre, saturados de su santo espíritu para lograr el propósito que Él tiene para la iglesia de Señor Jesucristo y para la vida suya y mía. Nuestra bendición, nuestra prosperidad está en que maduremos, crezcamos en el Señor Jesucristo para lograr las grandes victorias que Dios tiene para nosotros. Así es que cuando pienso en este, en esta situación, pienso, ¿quién mejor en la Biblia me paga un ejemplo de madurez y crecimiento? Cuando pienso de Saúl de Tarsis, de lo que fue, algo llegó a ser. Pienso, wow, si alguien me puede enseñar a mí de cómo crecer el Señor, es Saúl, que ahora conocemos como Pablo en la palabra del Señor. Es un hombre que fue de perverso a un giro de Jehová. Un hombre que estaba totalmente perdido a conocer el poder del Señor Jesucristo y establecer iglesias a cada lugar para que el nombre de Cristo fuera glorificado. Fue un hombre que en el capítulo 3 del libro de Filipenses, el principio, ¿verdad?, a tomar, ¿verdad?, este, dar a los filipenses algunos consejos de su persona. Habla de su entrega como judío. Dice que al octavo día, ¿verdad?, fue llevado pues, y recibió la circuncisión. Habla de cómo viene la tribu de Benjamín, como él es también un fariseo de fariseos, alguien que defiende la fe judaica, alguien que estaba listo para a todo caso, costo servir a su religión, aquel que ellos creía. Por lo tanto, es que entonces dice lo siguiente, cuando yo considero todo lo que fui, todo lo que logré en mi vida antes de Cristo, lo tengo como borasura para ganarme lo que ahora tengo en el Señor Jesucristo. Así que en el siguiente versículo, el versículo número 10, es donde quiero ir con usted. Porque ahí encontramos dos cosas que Pablo habla que tenemos que hacer para poder madurar en fe. Es aquí donde él habla al creyente, nos hace hablar a nosotros, has iniciado la carrera, has iniciado el camino, pero todavía hay camino que caminar, todavía hay cosas que pasar, todavía hay lecciones que aprender, todavía hay que madurar y tenemos que crecer. Y él menciona dos cosas. Y por eso que yo quiero hablar con usted en esta mañana. ¿Qué cosas tengo que hacer yo para madurar en mi fe? La primera cosa del versículo número 10, dice Pablo, que yo le conozca a él. Wow. Que yo lo conozca. Si un hombre conocía al Señor, fue él. Pero déjenle yo por la historia de la vida de Pablo. En el libro de los Hechos, cuando Esteban el diácono ha sido apedreado por la causa de Cristo, a los pies ¿Verdad? De Saúl de Tarsus pusieron la ropa de Esteban. Y cuando él contempló lo que estaba sucediendo, él propuso en su corazón, yo acabo con este movimiento. Yo me voy a, a, a encargar que esto se pare. Y viene un aspecto religioso, porque muchos tenemos la tendencia a criticarlo por lo que hizo, y qué barro, como que otro si nadie se hizo. No, mira, entienda, ven, vamos al otro lado de la moneda. En vista que era fariseo de fariseos, él estaba viendo el impacto del ministerio de Cristo en la raza humana, que venía contra la creencia judaica que él practicaba, él lo veía como un peligro a su religión, por lo tanto él quería parar el, aquel, aquel ataque que venía, él lo quería parar algo y yo iba a ser esa persona. Así es que veo desde ese punto de vista también, que como persona religiosa, él tenía todo el derecho, sentía con todo el derecho de pelear contra la causa del Señor Jesucristo. Así es que toma cartas y principia, ¿verdad? Su, su este trabajo de poder terminar con el cristianismo en ese tiempo mi hermano aunque él había visto el impacto del ministerio de Cristo nunca había conocido a Cristo él sabía de Cristo pero nunca lo había conocido adelantito en esa historia voy a probarle a usted que él sabía de Cristo hay una prueba fuerte de que este hombre ya sabía de Cristo por lo tanto va en su camino haciendo su obra, su trabajo, gozándose, sacando creyentes, encarcelándose, aún aún murieron por aquella causa, y aquel hombre con aquel orgullo, ¿verdad? diciendo, estoy haciendo lo que es justo y correcto por mi causa. 
de un día rumbo a Damasco. En pleno día le cae un rayo de luz más fuerte que el sol. La única luz más fuerte que el sol es aquel que hizo el sol, que es Dios Todopoderoso. Y cuando cae esa luz sobre él, ¡pum! él cae. Dice que estaba temblando, todos los soldados atónitos, no podían, ¿qué estaba sucediendo? Y él temblando y se apareció y le dijo, Señor, ¿qué quieres que yo haga? Él había oído de Jesús cuando conocía al Señor Jesucristo. ¿Cuántos en las iglesias hoy saben de Jesús, pero no conocen a Jesús? Están practicando su religión a lo máximo. Están cumpliendo con todo lo que la religión pide. Pero todavía no conocen al Señor Jesucristo. Saulo estaba cumpliendo. Saulo estaba haciendo lo que él pensaba que era derecho ante Dios. Pero no había conocido al Dios Todopoderoso. Y mi hermano y mi amigo, yo te hago la pregunta en esta hora. ¿Lo conoces o sabes él? Estás practicando religión. Hay gente que están listos a dar su vida por su religión y nunca conocer a aquel el cual representa la religión, quien es el Señor Jesucristo. Pero un día inolvidable en la vida de Saulo de Tarsis, tuvo un encuentro con el Señor Jesucristo y la causa en su mente cambió de ser aquel que quería terminar, aquel que iba a proclamar el mensaje del Señor Jesucristo. Pero fue llevado, allá ciego lo tuvo Dios en ayuno y oración, esperando oración sobre su vida. Ananías al principio rehúsa ir a orar por él, después de Dios le dice, este es un vaso escogido en mis manos. ¿Y cuántos han visto la vida tuya diciendo, no hay propósito, no hay por qué la vergüenza, por qué damos tiempo, por qué damos verdad, ninguna oportunidad a esta persona, pero en esa condición Dios nos vio a nosotros, nos dio sin propósito, pero los ojos de la gente no éramos nada, en los ojos de Dios somos alguien, muy especial, Él extiende su mano, Él extiende su perdón, Él extiende su misericordia para que usted y yo podamos lograr los propósitos que Dios tiene para nuestras vidas, porque en los ojos de la gente somos un cualquiera, en los ojos de la familia tal vez y amigos somos un cualquiera, pero en los ojos de Dios somos creación tuya y recibimos con salud, entonces somos hijos del Dios Todopoderoso también, por lo tanto van a niñas. pone manos sobre el siervo ya que el hombre restaura su vista y pasó de saber de a conocer al Señor Jesucristo. ¿Lo conoces? ¿En verdad lo conoces? ¿Cuántos años tienes en la iglesia? Y tal vez hace 20 años lo aceptaste, pero hace 19 que no lo sientes. ¿Cuánto tiempo hace que tú sabes? No has oído de él, lo conoces a él. Has entrado en su presencia, has disfrutado la bendición, su compañerismo, su fortaleza. Has visto su grandeza. De eso se trata en esta mañana. De poder creer y poder madurar nuestra fe. Y poder entender que Dios nos ama y Dios nos entra en control de todas las cosas. De poder entender que mi madurez me ayuda a mí a poder vencer los ataques del enemigo. A marchar adelante determinado que Dios está conmigo y si Dios por nosotros y su palabra quiere estar con nosotros. Desde cuando pasamos nosotros hacia esto, podemos nosotros realizar lo siguiente. Hay ciertos pasos que tenemos que tomar para lograr ¿verdad? la madurez en nuestra vida cual creyentes. Paso número uno, va hacia la iglesia. A la iglesia del Señor Jesucristo en términos general habla lo siguiente. Pues ya ven el capítulo 1 del libro de los hechos. Cristo hasta antes de ascender al cielo, dice a todos congregados, antes que canten ni un canto, antes que prediquen ni un sermón, aunque de ninguna clase, váyanse a Jerusalén y permanezcan ahí hasta que llene o llegue el Espíritu Santo y los llene de poder. Porque recibiréis poder cuando ha venido sobre nosotros el Espíritu Santo. Este es el inicio de la iglesia del Señor Jesucristo. Van a ser bajo una experiencia pentecostal, una experiencia de poder y autoridad. ¿Por qué decía el Señor de recibir poder? Porque él sabía que el poder era para dos cosas en el creyente. Persecución iba a venir contra todo creyente. Algunos tendrían que dar su vida por la causa de Cristo. Era menester permanecer firmes en su fe y marchar adelante poder, dedicación hacia la causa de Cristo. Y el otro era la unción del Espíritu Santo. Va a entregar un mensaje 
poderoso y grande que va a transformar vidas y corazones, que verá los vacíos de vidas y que cuando escuchar la palabra viene a saber que no era cualquier palabra, era la palabra de Dios activa y viva, llenando corazones y vida. Digo, antes que nada de esto suceda, tenemos que hacer estas cosas, recibir la plenitud del Espíritu Santo. Yo sé que hay muchos que dicen, eso fue para el tiempo pasado, pastor, eso, eso ya no existe. A través del libro de los hechos sigue hablando de diferentes tiempos que esto se manifestó. Después en el libro de Corintios, Pablo dice a la iglesia lo siguiente, él habla tocando los dones del Espíritu Santo y aún establece un orden en la cual viene lengua de interpretación de lenguas para que todo lo que se haga en la calle del Señor sea cosa de orden. Si esto iba a acabar, pues entonces ¿por qué dieron órdenes? El cómo se hicieran. Porque quiero que usted entienda la manifestación del Espíritu Santo en la vida de la iglesia. La iglesia está fundada en el poder del Espíritu Santo. Por algún motivo dijo Cristo, me voy promando otro consolador para que esté con usted. Y Él nos guiará a toda verdad y a toda justicia. Es esencial, es necesario el poder del Espíritu Santo de Dios con la iglesia. Usted y yo somos la iglesia necesitados tanto de un toque de Dios, una plenitud de su poder y su espíritu para marchar adelante y de poder en poder de victoria en victoria y que el mundo sepa que han pasado los mil años y Cristo todavía está vivo con un mensaje poderoso y efectivo que llena corazones de vida de aquellos que están necesitados. Lamentablemente esto ha muerto en muchas iglesias. La alabanza a Dios a muchas iglesias ya no se permite. O si usted dice un aleluya y un gloria, Dios lo ven como que usted es un fenómeno. Lo ven como que usted, no que usted no pertenece, que algo está mal con su vida, o oh, no. A lo contrario, la alabanza a Dios es un tiempo, por así decirlo, porque la gente a lo mejor es como una porra, un tiempo de entregar al Señor, un tiempo de poder ponernos con el Señor y decir, Señor, estoy de acuerdo con tu palabra que se está predicando, estoy de acuerdo con lo que está pasando, estoy de acuerdo con lo que el pastor está diciendo. Es un tiempo de comunión, un tiempo de estar con el Señor, un tiempo en el cual se amarra el predicador, el cantante con el público y sabemos que estamos en la presencia del Dios Todopoderoso donde el pueblo alaba, donde el pueblo glorifica, ahí se manifiesta el poder del Espíritu Santo del Señor. Cuando la iglesia principia a usar lo que Dios le ha dado, veremos la manifestación, el movimiento de su Santo Espíritu, y cuando dice la gente, no lo hagas, eso está fuera de orden, yo te digo a ti, a lo contrario, alaba a Dios, porque Él habita en las alabanzas de su pueblo, que nadie te calle, de gritar la grandeza, procurar la hermosura del Señor Jesucristo, que todo el mundo sepa, no me avergüence el Evangelio, porque es poder de Dios. Todos nosotros somos aficionados a nuestros equipos, y los vemos jugar, y si estamos en vivo, aún estamos en la casa, viendo por la televisión el juego y el partido, Tan pronto nuestro equipo hace algo bueno, gritamos, saltamos con alegría y nos da vergüenza que lo vea o que piense. Pero en esta hora no estamos con un equipo, no estamos con nuestro equipo favorito, estamos con el Rey de Reyes y Señor de Señores, que merece toda honra y toda gloria. Y que a través de esto usted va a recibir la plenitud del Señor, va a ser contacto, va a estar en comunión con el Señor Jesucristo, va a darle todo lo que Él merece sin avergonzarse de la grandeza de Cristo en su corazón. Después a un nivel personal, en la persona tiene que tomar la iniciativa de la invitación que Cristo hizo. Cristo dijo, si alguno quiere venir en pos de mí, tome el primer paso, nieguese a sí mismo. Y además, no cuenta sino cuál sea la primera cosa. Pero la primera cosa, tu primer estorbo, la primera cosa que impide que tú recibas es que no seas entregado totalmente a Él. Él quiere todo o no quiere nada. Él no quiere que lo sirvas porque te conviene, Él quiere que lo sirvas porque lo amas. Que entiendas que hay una relación íntima con el Señor Jesucristo. El mundo no te la dio, el mundo no te la puede quitar. Cualquier gente tienes que abrazar esto y procura lo siguiente. Cuando dice, nígate a ti mismo, ¿qué es lo siguiente? Ahora que eres nueva criatura en Cristo, ya no puedes practicar aquello que antes practicabas. Las cosas del mundo son del mundo, tú ya no eres del mundo, eres ser viviente, eres templo del Espíritu Santo representando el reino del Señor Jesucristo. Así que abandona el mundo, deja aquellas cosas que antes te traían aflicción, aquellas cosas en las cuales tú buscabas gozo, felicidad, para los vacíos de tu corazón, ahora torna aquello 
por voltear tus espaldas y sea la criatura que Dios fue. Porque la palabra de Dios dice en el creyente que aquel que comenzó a nosotros la buena obra la sigue perfeccionando hasta el día de Jesucristo. Hay un crecimiento en tu propia vida, hay cosas en tu vida que tienen que enderezarse, hay cosas que tal vez no están totalmente entregadas al Señor, cualquier cosa que impide la plenitud de Cristo en tu vida, tú ve ante el altar del Señor, pide perdón, limpia tu vida, limpia tu mente y permite que el Señor sea el Señor de tu vida a nivel ministerial. Para Dios no le importa qué tan bonita es tu voz, a él le importa qué tan bonito está tu corazón. Hijo mío, dame tu corazón porque de él mana la vida. Cuando hablamos de alabanza, la adoración, hay tantos que tienen ese tremendo talento y una voz bellísima. Pero cuando eres utilizado en el altar de una iglesia para cantar alabanza al Señor, no se trata de ti, se trata de aquel en el cual tú has confiado, del cual tú estás representando. Al subir a aquella plataforma, aquí abajo en el piso, dejas tu persona y te subes como vaso de Dios, transformado por su sangre, utilizado por el Espíritu Santo, que cada palabra que salga de tu boca no es palabra bonita, es palabra ungida por el Espíritu Santo el Señor que a través de tu persona fluya, a través de tu canto fluya, no la hermosura belleza en tu voz, que fluya el poder, la potencia del Dios Todopoderoso en el cual tú representas, que represente la historia en canto de un Dios de poder que puede dar necesidades. Utiliza tu talento, no para ser reconocido, utiliza tu talento para que el nombre de Dios sea glorificado. Esto no se trata de fama, esto no se trata de reconocimiento, se trata de un templo del Espíritu Santo alabando y glorificando a Dios por el talento que te fue dado. Canta con todo el corazón, canta con todo el alma, pero ¿cómo puedes cantar de lo que tú no conoces? Mi hermano cantante, si te falta ese último paso, principia a representar no, no lo que tú eres, pero lo que Cristo es en tu persona. Principia a proyectar un mensaje de poder de autoridad. Y cuando tú cantes, el pueblo pueda sentir la unción del Espíritu Santo bajando a través de aquella alabanza. No porque eres famoso, no porque eres bueno, porque Cristo es el Señor de nuestras vidas. Él está llenando todas nuestras necesidades a través de tu talento, de tus habilidades que Dios te ha dado para poder cantar las grandes y maravillas del Señor Jesucristo. Músicos, tome el talento que Dios te ha dado para glorificar su santo y bendito nombre. Porque entienda lo siguiente. La música es una parte muy interesante, especialmente los dos latinos. Yo sé que aquí en la iglesia, cuando empieza la música a tocar, tantos así, ¿verdad? De ritmo como el poderoso Israel y cosas de la naturaleza, como que se nos levanta el ánimo. La gente principia que aplaudir, a gozar, entra un buen tiempo. Porque somos de ambiente, somos, ¿verdad? De emoción en muchas ocasiones. Pero yo quiero que usted, músico, cuando usted se prepare para tocarle al Señor, se prepare no para causar emoción, sino para ir convicción al pueblo de Señor Jesucristo que cada nota que usted toque que cada nota del piano la guitarra, las tamboras todo lo que reflexione el mensaje en música venga a estremecer los cimientos del corazón y la vida del creyente y puedan saber que es Dios hablando a sus vidas y sus corazones utilizando el talento que tú tienes la vida que tú tienes para bendecir verdad al pueblo que está delante de ti tú has sido llamado a bendecir no a entretener has llamado para ser de bendición no para recibir la gloria, a lo contrario, ha sido llamado para ser siervo y para tocar la vida de aquellos que tienen necesidad. Hay tanta gente en nuestro pueblo que en verdad puede identificarse con la música. Utiliza la música con ministerio, una forma en la cual el Espíritu Santo puede ser usado a través de tu vida y el mundo puede saber la grandeza de un Dios todopoderoso. Porque lo más importante en tu vida para el creyente que pueda lograr, ¿verdad?, los pasos que Dios tiene para tu vida, cual músico poder reflejar la imagen del Señor Jesucristo. Me encanta ir al libro de Hechos, el capítulo 4, versículo 13. Cuando Pedro y Juan ya han llegado a la puerta de Hermosa y han sanado al hombre paralítico, están ahí, ¿verdad?, en la de Hermosa, más bien dicho, se paran y antes de recibir, ¿verdad?, reconocimiento y gozo de parte del pueblo, son llevados ante el concilio. Y ante el concilio, ¿verdad?, les están, ¿verdad?, regañando por su parte de acá el Evangelio. Le dicen que ya no lo pueden hacer. Lo que me gusta a mí, el versículo 13, dice lo siguiente. Que los que están en el concilio, considerando quién eran ellos, eran, viendo a Pedro y Juan, dicen, sabían que no eran hombres de letra. De acuerdo, uno tenía mucha educación, pero una cosa podía ver que habían estado con el Señor Jesucristo. 
Oh, mi hermano, que la gente pueda ver en ti que has estado con el Señor Jesucristo, que eres algo mucho más grande, que te identifica con aquel que va en templo de hermosa y que usted va, que identifique en tu persona la grandeza del Cristo Todopoderoso, la esperanza, la fortaleza de un mundo perdido a través de una iglesia y un creyente que alaba a Dios en espíritu y en verdad. Toma la oportunidad, toma aquel momento, date cuenta para el creyente que el poder de Dios va a fluir por tu persona y tú ser un portavoz grande del mensaje de Señor Jesucristo. Termino este reto a tu vida con la segunda cosa que dice Pablo, dice, y que yo conozca el poder de su, resur su resurrección. ¡Wow! El poder de resurrección, ve cuando Cristo muere y resucita, Él venció al enemigo más grande del hombre, que es la muerte. Él vino a lograr, ¿verdad?, un propósito, decirnos, en la angustia más grande, yo te estoy en control de todas las cosas. Él vino a enseñarnos que ni aún la muerte tiene poder sobre nuestras vidas, porque Él es como le está llenando todas nuestras necesidades. Nosotros para que podemos realizar que lo que Cristo hizo por la cruz del Calvario, más bien la resurrección, fue algo de ejemplo para nuestra vida. Pues ve, el mundo se gozó. El viernes cuando Cristo entrega su Espíritu, vienen todos los acontecimientos sobrenaturales. Cristo es quitado de la tumba, o oh, perdón, quitado de la cruz y puesto en la tumba. El mundo está gozando, el mundo perdido está gozando por la muerte de Cristo. El mundo creyente está lamentando la muerte de Cristo. Pero al tercer día, no es que todos dormían. Ahí no había quien gritaba ni a favor ni en contra. En una tumba fría, el cuerpo de Cristo principia a respirar. Principia a incorporarse. Porque entiendo una cosa. El que representa vida es el Señor Jesucristo. Cuando ese poder de resurrección viene sobre su persona, se levanta el león de Judá a defender el pueblo y los derechos que representaba de poder y autoridad para cada creyente, que entendamos que ni la muerte nos puede ganar. Él dijo después de su resur resurrección, cuando después que resucitó, dijo, y ahora todo poder me es dado en el cielo y en la tierra. Ese es el Cristo que representamos. Es el Cristo de resurrección, el Cristo de poder, el Cristo de autoridad, y el Cristo para llenar todas tus necesidades. Ese es este mismo Cristo que nos hizo entender lo siguiente. Escuche bien lo que le voy a decir. Para que la resurrección pudiera pasar, él tuvo que morir primero. La muerte pone en juego la resurrección. La resurrección pone en juego cumplimiento de las promesas de Dios. Porque todo lo que él prometió, todo lo que está escrito, ahora es poder por su resurrección. Y porque él vive, nosotros también viviremos. Por lo tanto, hay que reconocer que la muerte y la resurrección de Jesucristo es algo que la iglesia debe celebrar no solamente una vez al año, sino todos los días de nuestras vidas. Está celebrando a Cristo. Es tu celebración. ¿Por qué digo conocer el poder de su, resur de su resurrección? Porque el poder de resurrección es lo que necesitas para vencer las tentaciones, los contratiempos, el enemigo que ataca tu vida. Es lo que necesitas para tener poder y autoridad sobre lo que está rodeando, para eliminar la tristeza, para eliminar el desánimo y ponerte sobre la roca que es el Señor Jesucristo, que en esta hora el poder de resurrección es una parte activa contigo. Y así, como la resurrección de Cristo pasó en el secreto, donde nadie estuvo presente, donde nadie pudo ver el evento, pero presenciamos y vemos la autoridad de aquella resurrección, ahora tú entras a tu aposento. Cierra la puerta de tu aposento y ora a tu Padre que está en secreto. Y tu Padre que está en secreto te va a recompensar en público. ¿Por qué? Porque Él ha resucitado y está allí listo para llenar tu necesidad. Mi hermano, toma el poder de resurrección, vence al enemigo, vence las cosas que han atacado tu corazón, las cosas que han tenido deprimido, que tienen detenido, ponlas en las cosas del olvido, en las manos del Señor y el Cristo de resurrección, aquel que dijo vengo para que tengas vida y la tengas en abundancia, venga a traer vida abundante en tu persona y que este año que viene sea un año de bendición, de prosperidad para tu vida, que tú puedas saber que Cristo no murió en, en, en vano, sino que resucitó para mí a mí la autoridad de proclamar la grandeza del Señor Jesucristo. Mundo cristiano celebra porque Cristo ha resucitado de entre los muertos. 
que esta mañana sea tu mañana de poder abrazar las promesas de Dios. Y en vez de estar lamentando lo que nos está sucediendo el día presente, entendamos que lo que pasó dos mil años atrás es respuesta a lo que está sucediendo hoy. La victoria es hoy día y hay que comprar. Ya tenemos la victoria y en Cristo somos más que vencedores. Prepara tu iglesia. Yo le voy a levantar un ejército de todo esto. Voy a levantar un ejército de hombres y mujeres poderosos. No un cualquiera, no, hijos, hombres y mujeres poderosos, guerreros en el Evangelio, listos para proclamar la grandeza de Cristo. Mi hermano, que Dios te acompañe, levante tus ánimos y te dé el propósito de vivir. Y porque Él vive, nosotros también viviremos. Dios Santo, te doy gracias en esta hora por tu palabra, porque tu palabra es la verdad. Yo espero que algo dicho en esta hora se le haya retado el corazón de aquellos que están escuchando tu palabra. Y podamos, Señor, recibir de ánimo, fortaleza, dirección, resignación a servirte con todo lo que tenemos y hacer que el Señor de nuestras vidas tome esta mañana y instituye en los corazones una alabanza perpetua, que quiere decir que nunca se acabe, que permanezca ante tu altar con la determinación de aquel que es el mismo ayer, hoy y por todos los siglos, que llene nuestras necesidades nos permita entrar a su presencia con grande regocijo, con alabanza y recibir esta victoria. Extiende tu mano a necesitar. Sal al enfermo, trae ánimo al desanimado, levanta al caído y que estas siguientes semanas sean una semana de bendición. Yo pongo a tus hijos, a tu pueblo, en tu fiel cuidado, en el nombre poderoso de Cristo. Doy gracias a Dios por lo que me ha dado esta hora de estar con ustedes. El poder declarar con todo mi corazón lo que Dios había puesto. Y preparo un ejército, ¿verdad?, para el avivamiento que ha de venir todavía de parte del Señor. Y que en esta hora su vida, cual creyente, sea entregada al Señor. Y puedas entender que esta mañana es el principio de algo grande para tu vida. Dios te bendiga. Y hasta el miércoles nos vemos en la clase que tenemos para cada uno de ustedes. Dios le acompañe, esté con ustedes. Sigue una clase pequeña para los niños, después nos despedimos. Dios le bendiga, está con ustedes. Mi hermano, Cristo vive en esta mañana. Él recibe toda honra y toda gloria desde hoy para siempre.